the biosphere lectures are an idea of Joe Overty, who's the communications lady that looks after the biosphere. And she had the idea, maybe we should actually have an annual lecture series. And having had that idea, she then asked me, uh, what did I think? And I said, I thought it was a fantastic idea. And then she said, well, would you like to give the first one? So, <laughs> so here I am. <laughs> and it's a sellout, which, uh, which is brilliant. Do you think that could be an indication that people are now making more of a conscious effort to be proactive in, in helping the environment and taking an active interest in things like biosphere reserves? I think that's almost certain because there have been so many reports released in the last six months which paint not particularly happy pictures of the global environment. And I think this does filter through. It filters through particularly to young people. But I think it filters through to every everybody. And can you just tell us what the, what the lecture is gonna, gonna talk about? Well, the lecture is entitled don't ask what you can do for your biosphere reserve, but what your biosphere reserve can do for you. And that's, of course, a teasy title, really in designed to make people think, what, well, what can I do? Uh, it's, it's actually sponsored by Zurich, if I can say that. Um, uh, if not, it's sponsored. <laughs> and, uh, and that's an important issue, that, that business is getting behind this. And I looked at the bus timetable uh, when I arrived last night, and I think there are at least two advertisements in there which have the Biosphere Reserve logo, which means that businesses are picking up on this. And that's really what's important, not just for the Biosphere Reserve, but the environment globally. Because governments can only do so much, civil society can only do so much, and business is where the energy and, quite bluntly, the money in the world is today. And if business gets behind these things, then there's a chance they'll really work. That's uh, really interesting, actually, because there is there has been a lot of aim primarily at the public to, to do their bit. And you see a lot of people are. But as you say, it's the businesses that are the big dogs that need to do something to change the way the world is going. And do you think, have you got many businesses coming to the lecture tonight, do you know? I'm not sure how many uh, there are actually coming from business as opposed to people who are working for business, but I do believe there are a number, uh, and and that that's important as well as as well as people from government, MHKs, and so on, uh, and the, the the public. But of course, the the public in the end vote for the politicians. The public have shares in or buy the products of businesses, and so the public actually are in control. It's just that they haven't realised they're in control. So what sort of, can you give me some examples of those little things that can accumulate to a big thing that members of the public can do? I mean, there are a lot of, like we've got Beach Buddies, which is brilliant, but for people that have a bu busy lifestyle and can't afford to meet up and do those big community events, what small things can they do in their day-to-day -day life? The smallest thing, but the easiest thing, is to actually have a few plants that are native to the island in their garden or on their win in their window box or in their back patio or whatever, because the more native plants that are included in the wider landscape, and I include the tans and, and, uh, in this, the more that will actually help the wildlife, the insects, the birds, the small mammals, and so on, uh, all find uh, a means to, to live the lives they need to, to live. We have the impression that, that nature is somehow out there in the, <laughs> in the, in the wild blue yonder. Uh, it's not, it's all around us. And uh, the more that people can bring native things into their gardens, as I say, in the window box, on the patio, wherever, uh, the more it will, uh, it will bring back uh, native wildlife. And you mentioned in your lecture about how biosphere reserves and um, helping the environment can help enhance our culture. And I suppose that kind of breaches on what you just talked about, um, using planting uh, home plants, basically. Absolutely. But by culture, I mean everything. And on the island here, the, the degree to which Manx is now coming back as, as a language, particularly in schools, and, and old adults are learning it. 
I'm never here long enough to do very much myself. Uh, but it's is language is really really important, and I spend a lot of time in Australia, of course, and that's where we've begun to realise that that the culture of the First Nations people in Australia, the Aboriginal people, is is manifest through language. But their languages are, are absolutely linked to the environment. That's where their languages evolve from, understanding how to use the environment effectively. Uh, and Manx has a few things like that as well. So, uh, yes, culture in its broadest sense is, is actually important. This radio station is part of the Manx culture and, and using it to even talk about this. It's, it's how we actually communicate and it's how we get these ideas out and seeded in people's minds. So you mentioned Beach Buddies. I mean, Beach Buddies is a classic example. Uh, but if, if every firm on the island whether or not they sign up to be an informal partner. But if, if every firm on the island gave a few hours, a day or so, a year for their employees to go and do a specific project in the Biosphere Reserve, helping the government departments, that would be amazing. Uh, and I think that's already starting in some ways. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that really works. And finally, um, you're talking about how Biosphere Reserves link with global initiatives as well. Uh, can you give us some examples of those global initiatives and how the how the links will come about? This is a really important issue actually because th there are two main uh, global conventions if you like at the moment that are important. The first is the climate change convention and the second is the convention on biological diversity. There's a third which is to do with desertification which doesn't yet impact the island and will take a long time <laughs> hopefully never, that that will happen. But those, the other two are really important. And so the way in which the Climate Change Convention can actually be put into action, as opposed to just being a talk shop, is through examples like Biosphere Reserves. And the important thing to remember is the Biosphere Reserve is not another nature reserve. In fact, it's not a nature reserve at all. It's about a place where people live and interact with nature and hopefully in learn to interact better with nature. So understanding how the Climate Change Convention can be put into action and understanding how the Biodiversity Convention can be put into action is really important. Now, the island has a, has a biodiversity strategy, but it's a very complicated strategy, and it's probably too complicated, to be honest. Uh, I can say that coming from outside. To actually be effective, you need to do simple things, and that's where the Biosphere Reserve can actually help simplify um, what people can do to be really, really effective. When you say overcomplicated, how how do you mean? I mean, it's it's probably about fifty pages too long. Uh, you need to have very. We've learned time and time again that the more complicated you make strategies and action plans and so on, the nicer they look, but the less effective they are. A and again, I'll just refer back to Australia, if I may, because after several decades of, of ever more complicated strategies with lists of targets that are never met, finally the light is switched on and everybody is saying, actually what we need to do, we need to find where are the directions that we need to head and let's get pathways to get there. Not have we got X percent of this or are we saving X percent of that? Because along the way, if we're on that pathway, we'll achieve those things and we'll tick those boxes. But if we're focused only on ticking the boxes, we'll never get there. And there's been quite a lot of uh, protests, uh, as we saw in London, and there's been a lot of student protests here about um, government, you know, taking action, stopping just talking about it and actually doing something. What are your thoughts on, on those student protests and young people getting involved and making their voices heard? Well, I understand totally. Uh, young people are really frustrated. I, I work in a university. Uh, and I talk regularly to, to people, um, to, to young people, the, the, the students there. And the messages I'm getting are actually not nice. The messages are, I feel angry, I feel depressed, um, I'm not sure what I can really do. And um, th they're all, that's really what they feel because they feel essentially abandoned by government, apparently not doing anything, uh, not being able to do anything. But as I said earlier, if if we realize that actually governments are us, <laughs> yes, of course, they're people we elect, and then we kick them when they don't do what we think they, we, they should be doing. But we elect them, and we can de-elect them, or we can instruct them what to do. 
And similarly, um, businesses, if we don't like what a particular business is doing, then we don't buy the product. But people are not not buying iPhones. They're not not buying Samsung. They're not not buying unsustainable products. And yet they're still depressed. So we really have to <laughs> to have a, a, if you like, a social revolution in terms of how we handle that. How do you make people aware that they're the ones with the power? I actually have no idea. That that That's beyond me. Uh, except to keep reminding people that they actually do have the power. They are the ones <laughs> that control all of these things. And the number of times you hear people say, they. Well, actually, it's not they. It's you. You either put they there or you're supporting they by buying their things or having shares in them or whatever. Just move. If everybody moved their account out of a bank because they didn't like what a bank was doing and put it into another bank or started a bank of their own, mutual societies came about exactly because of that, because people didn't like what the big banks were doing in those olden days. But now the mutual societies are becoming bank-like. <laughs> and so, you know, we need, we need to continually have that revolution. But that revolution is in people's hands. The worry I have is that when you have strikes by students, when you have um, protests that can turn not particularly nice, that's not a, a good way to channel it. There is negative energy, but that's not a good way to channel it. The way to try channel it is say, okay, I need to go and help Beach Buddies. I, I need to go and, and, and help. I need to go and knock on the door of DEFA and say, I know you don't have enough staff to do all the things that you need to do in the countryside. How can I help? I can give you two days a year. Tell me what I can do and what those days are, and I'll be there.